had a crap news out of it. Okay. If technician A says you should begin HVAC problem diagnosis with a thorough inspection. Is he right? Yeah. Technician B says you can determine from the inspection what type of system you are dealing with. What, what, whenever we're talking about what type of system, what do we mean by that? R12, R134. Well, yeah, that's part of it, but what else? There, that's one of the, that's the couple of the you know, nomenclatures, but what else do we have? Type of system. If I say what type of somebody, if, I, if you're over here and uh, you're going to ask somebody whenever they come in there talking to you about an AC problem, you say, what type of system you got? What types of systems are there? Fixed orifice, oh. expansion valve, this kind of thing. That's what we're talking about. Oh, okay. Got that? All right. Now then, um, technician A says sometimes nothing wrong. The incidentally, that was both of those guys were right. That's a C. <laughs> technician A says sometimes nothing is wrong with a system when there's a complaint of insufficient cooling. Is he right? No. Yeah. Is he right? Okay. Technician B says you should begin diagnosing this complaint by checking the AC system pressures. No. As well, it's actually A. A is right. Um, and what you do is, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to put a thermometer in that register and you're going to be looking. You're going to be looking at your thermometer and you're going to see how it compares to outside temperatures. <coughs> you know, if it's really, really hot outside, it's not going to seem to be cooling as good on the inside because it's only taking what's outside and you know, it's using the air conditioner as a heat pump. It's taking heat from the inside of the car and putting it outside. If it's really, really hot outside, the AC is just not going to work as good, basically. And sometimes you'll hear one of people will say, my air conditioner cools just fine in, at night, but it doesn't do well in the heat of the day. Now, in those particular cases, there may be a little bit lower refrigerant, and you may see some short cycling going on, that kind of stuff. Um, also, uh, and, and we're going to be getting deeper into this actual hands-on AC stuff as the weather warms up. Uh, now, you guys know when spring break is, right? Next week. Next week. Some, I had told the president of the college one time, I think we should abolish spring break. Because <laughs> everybody gets kind of off track. You know? <clears throat> what I don't want is anybody taking off a couple of extra days before spring break and staying gone a couple of days after spring break. That's kind of silly. You're not in high school anymore. And I'm not in Kansas anymore because I'm here, okay? That was a sort of a Dorothy Toto, you know, Wizard of Oz thing on Kansas anymore. You remember that? Okay. All right. Now then, you got um, technician A says while the compressor clutch is off, it's okay if the pulley and clutch plate touch. You right about that? No, he ain't right about that. If it's dragging on it, it's going to wear it out, and it's going to be dust and everything, and it's not good for it to touch. Now, sometimes they get a little bit worn out. They're out of, you know, out of line. They're not supposed to have any. They're supposed to have a little air gap. It's like 20 thousandths of an inch. But they're not supposed to be touching at all. Now, what did I tell you about your air gap? If the air gap gets a little bit too wide, even though everything else may be just fine, when the thing gets hot, it's subject not to pull the compressor in. Here's what happens is somebody goes, they turn on the air conditioner. You see the compressor running. They drive around. They stop at a, at a stop sign down there in traffic or whatever and everything. And all of a sudden, all of those switches and everything send juice out there. The switches and the relays and whatever that car has got will send juice out there to the, to the compressor. And the compressor doesn't kick in. Even though there's a magnetic field there, it's not strong enough to overcome that too wide air gap. Now, how does the air gap get too wide if it started out being okay? Think about it. What's touching when your air conditioner is engaged? The pulley and the hub, right? Mm -hmm. Now, every time they snap in, there's going to be a little bit of a little bit of a slide, right, on the way in, and it's going to eventually wear the metal out to where it's farther away. Oh, okay. See what I'm saying? So, in some case, and like you, if somebody says, "Hey, my, it's, it cools really good to start with," and then it stops cooling because it gets hot. Because it gets hot, and it's not just that it gets, you know, it gets hot, and there's a little bit more resistance in the coil, the magnetic field's not quite as strong, and so on and so forth. It won't pull in. Everything is fine. There's plenty of refrigerant charge. All the relays and switches are working just fine. And remember what I told you to do to find that? You take a screwdriver handle or something. Be careful when you're doing this now. And you whack the end of the compressor, and you just whack it. And if it clicks in, you know you got to set your air gap. That's what fill is. One time, the welding is... Huh? Don't you do that with shims? 
You do, yeah. You set the well, on, except on the GMC, you got a special tool. It's an interference fit all the way in. Mm-hmm. And with that special tool, you dial it in and you stop it exactly where it's supposed to be. You don't shim that one. Now on the Chryslers and on the Fords, uh, you're typically and you know, like on, on my Jeep and all that. You're gonna. It's really cool on the Fords the way they do it. You got a bolt in the middle. You just grab the clutch hub and you jerk it off of there. It's got little little uh, teeth in it. But only some of these GM ones and all that kind of stuff, they gotta put a dead gumbo hard hard one to pull off. And you gotta put this little tool. It's almost it's vaguely similar to a power steering pump pulley puller, except it's got threads on it. I got one of them things. And I actually demonstrated on the GMC, you know. But uh, anyway, but there's so many different kinds of threads on these pullers a lot of times when you have them threaded clutches you gotta pull off that nobody has all those adapters, or almost nobody has. It's a real pain to, you know, come up with that sometimes. Um, on some of the old Fords, they used to they just used a five eighths bolt. <laughs> the threads were five eight worth five eighths. You put a five eighths bolt screw in there, push it right off. You know, really smart. Okay, now let me go on down here. They shouldn't touch. Technician B says too much air gap can cause clutch slippage in, during engagement. You know, three. That's uh, true, right? Yeah, three. That's B. Yeah, but actually, it, if you got too much air gap, yeah, it can cause clutch slippage. But usually, it's going to cause it not to engage at all whenever it gets warm. Technician A says oily residue on a hose can indicate a refrigerant leak. Is he right? Hello? Oily residue on a hose can indicate a refrigerant leak. Somebody tell me. That's true. That's true. Technician B says the residue is normal for most connections. That's Wrong. Not supposed to be no greasy stuff nowhere. Remember what I told you about them slow leaks? I've seen them doggone leaks where, uh, remember I told you James McCurley's van had a leak. He would charge that thing up with a refrigerant and in two days the refrigerant would be gone. And when we found the leak, where was it? It was a little. There was a hose that was going to the rear air, and it was a oh, yeah. big old suction line hose. And it was one of these where the hose is going up there and it's crimped, right? Mm-hmm. And it was leaking right there. And when we sprayed, when we, when we pressured it up with nitrogen gas, which is what you do, you got a nitrogen gas system regulators because the nitrogen gas, so you can push it in and let it out, and you're not breaking any laws because most of what we got here is nitrogen anyway. So we pressured that thing up with nitrogen gas through a regular through a, through a regulator and all that stuff, and you. You got to be careful how much pressure you put in there because you can make a leak when there wasn't one if you put too much, right? So we put that put that nitrous and gas pressure in there, and we sprayed the soap water bottle water on that uh, or soapy water on that thing, and it would make one tiny little bubble that was about an eighth of an inch in diameter every minute or so. That was a tiny little leak, but listen to this: that son of a gun was dumping the refrigerant every two days. That's how tiny that leak was and how fast it was getting rid of the refrigerant. You know I and mean? we put that hose on there. He's been cooling ever since. He had no more trouble. Let's replace that one over. I'll tell you, some of them slow leaks are a booger bear to find. And what you're generally going to do when you've got a really slow leak, when you got a really slow leak, about all you can do after you put dye in it, if it, nothing shows up, you replace every O-ring on that sucker. I mean, every put a new accumulator on it. Because it don't cost much for a new accumulator. If you get an accumulator and you're you're a shop, you can get an accumulator for one company I know about out in Nevada for sixteen dollars, American made, a really nice one. You know, and about they're about sixty bucks usually from the parts house. But anyway, you pop one of them darn things on there with new O-rings and all that. And uh, the only bad part about it is some of these air conditioning lines, they like to gall. Yeah. What do you mean by that? Like, you tell you trying to break like them suckers loose, they won't come off. They just flat won't come off. You start trying to turn them. Yeah, they seize up. But they don't always do that. You know, if you're if things are not like supposed to be, you know, you're you're okay. But anyway, you replace every O ring you can find on that doggone thing and put a new accumulator on it and see what that does. If you can't find the leak, if the dye won't show it, if your you know, leak detector won't find it and all that, you replace all the O rings. The compressor likes to leak too. You know what I'm saying? The yep. compressor likes to leak too, so make doggone sure you recognize the fact that the compressor is a is a potential leak point. Sometimes it'll leak through the housing on the compressor. Have a porous casting or something like that. What does porous mean? It's got a rough texture to it, or it's got little tiny holes in it. Bingo! Texture. Little tiny holes in it. All right. Now then. All right. We're going. Let me let me move on here. Well, Chelsea's got lots of hard work. I got to put her there. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Now then. Uh, let's see. Uh, technician A says a quick check of AC system operation is to feel the temperature of the suction and discharge lines. Is he right about that? Yes. I really like that. Um, technician B says the suction line should be cold and the discharge line hot after a minute of system operation. It's 
backwards, ain't it? Well, that is probably, uh, you know, no, well, no, no, no. Uh, the suction line should be cold. The, one, the big one coming from the evaporator to the compressor should be cold all the way to the compressor. But what the problem is with that question is, is probably, you're probably not going to feel it after a minute. You're probably going to have to run it longer than a minute before you feel, you know, feel it as good as it's going to get. Um, and, uh, you know, the answer key to the doggone thing says that A is the only one that's right. And I'm going to say, if that, if that thing's working right, you're going to start feeling a cold suction line pretty doggone quick. All right, now let me ask you this. Now, this is a cold cold quiz cold thing. Right. This is a quiz thing. You know, I know, the, I know the time changed last, you know, this weekend, but don't zone out on me here. What if, Brandon, well, what if you're, somebody comes in, and we've talked about this before, and I'm trying to burn it in, okay? What if somebody comes in and I say, my air conditioner's not cooling worth a flip. I get, you know, tepid air or air that doesn't really feel cool at all coming out of my thing, and I'm burning up. Okay, so what are you going to do first? Tell them to rattle the windows down. <laughs> Well, I probably already do it now. But now what you're doing is you fire it up. And so you got to remember, you're going to get to charge them for fixing their air conditioner. You won't get paid anything for telling them to ride with the windows down. You know what I mean? Now, if this is your uncle and he's not going to pay you nothing, you might tell him to ride with the windows down. You see what I'm saying? But uh, yeah, I'll tell you something about air conditioner repairs. If you can get somebody's air conditioner cooling again on a hot summer day, you will be their hero for a very long time. I'm telling you, you will be their hero. You can fix anything else. They'll even put up with a greasy hand print or two if that thing's blowing cold. <laughs> Man, if my air conditioner's blowing cold, I don't really care about the greasy hand print on the fender as long as I got cold air. I'm not saying you should leave greasy hand prints, but you get where I'm going. All right, now then, what you going to do first, Brandon? It's blowing. You, it, hey, this thing, you, you, first you're going to sit down in the car and go verify the complaint. It's blowing warm. Yeah, this thing t- feels warm. You fool your temperature controls, same thing. Is what what you gonna what, what, what are you gonna look for next? The touch on the line. I want to see if the compressor is running. I want to see if the compressor is running. If the compressor is running, is the compressor running? Okay, let's say the compressor is running, and let's say what's your next immediate check? This simple and cheap. See Feel of them. What if the compressor is running all the time, and the lines are about the same temperature? Huh? That's long long with the pressure. Long. Well, I'm going to put the uh, I'm actually going to put the gauges on it. And what should I see with a compressor running and the gauges connected, low and high side? What should I see? Mm-hmm. Come on now, don't play dumb with me. What do you see? You're going to see about 30 pounds on the cold side and about 150 to 200 on the high side. Now these numbers will be a little higher in the summer, a little lower in the winter. But what if you see both of them at about, or maybe maybe the low side's about. 70 and the high side is about 120 and they're bouncing. He's got a leak. Bad compressor. Got that? In other words, the high side's low. I mean, the low side's high and the high side's low, lower than it should be. Remember what I told you there ought to be? Now, remember this. I want you guys to burn this in because we're going to have to get you to hook up to a lot of vehicles and get used to that. Matter of fact, uh, whenever I get through with Chelsea today, she's going to be an expert air conditioner refrigerant person because she's going to check. About she's gonna check every trainer car I got, and when she's through, they're all gonna be cooling, or she's gonna know what's wrong, or she's gonna know why not. Is that fair enough? You're gonna know how to do air conditioning work at the end of the day, as far as the refrigerant part of it. Got it? All right. So now listen to this: if you can pinpoint a bad compressor by looking at your pressures. Now, what if both of the pressures are low? What if your pressure is low on both sides? The orifice is stopped cooling. Up. Got it? You hear me? Well, what about this? What if you got a freezing cold, frosty suction line and a blistering hot liquid line, but you're still blowing warm air on the inside? Could it be a bad accumulator? Well, how about your logic there? <laughs> <laughs> he knew that he knew the terminology, didn't he? What are you going to do? We talked about this before. I got to make sure you guys burned it in. It's blister. I mean, tepid air on the inside. Okay. What if we've got and and let's I mean let's say our pressures even look normal. Our pressure on the uh, low side, let's say, is running about thirty, and maybe it's cycling, maybe it's not. The pressure on the high side is running about one seventy-five to two hundred, right? And you're saying, well, and, and I see a cold suction line, a really hot liquid line, and discharge, discharge and liquid line are both supposed to be hot. 
One's carrying liquid, the other's carrying high pressure gas, you know, the discharge line. Carrying high pressure gas, which you change into a high pressure liquid and go into the liquid line, hits the uh, orifice, goes through there. Okay, that tells me the refrigerant part of this thing, as far as I can tell, at least right now, is okay. Now, what's one of my possibilities? Somebody needs to tell me something. We've talked about this so many times that you guys should know this. We have deers in the headlights. What did I talk about the heater core? Do you think we may have a blend door problem? Where uh, somebody you know, put, put a pencil or some stuff up on their dash and it rattled off down through the defrost duct and got in there and fouled the blend door. Or the blend door actuator, if it's one of these electric ones, is fouled up. And it's staying so that it's letting warm air in there all the time. You mix warm air with that cold air, the air conditioner will be working its fanny off and you can still get warm air out of there. Got it? So you need to be double checking all that stuff. Now, what if your blend door, what if you determine, let's say on this GMC out here, you can actually see the blend door actuator, as I remember. And what if you turn your knobs and you don't see that thing moving? Or maybe it tries to move and then it goes back. Gotcha. I'm going to take that blend door actuator off of there and I'm going to grab that blend door at the end of it with my fingers. I'm going to see if I can turn it by hand. Thump, 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 thump. If I can turn it by hand, then I know the blend door actuator is probably at fault. I mean, if I can turn it easily by hand, you know, or, or with, grab it with something... Or maybe get an old blend door actuator I've saved the shaft out of and slide it over there and turn it by hand because you'll be holding the little gear. It'll be easier to do. Wait a minute, though. What if I find out that I can't move the blend door by hand? I'm going to have to break that thing down and get into that evaporator case. That's when you give your customer a big estimate because you're going to have to rip the dash out of that damn thing. Hey, I got an idea. You can put a heater core in one day. This is pull the whole dash out. we got to get air pumped up and going again, okay? All right. And, uh, all right, now then, she shall not surely die. All right, so now what question, what question are we on? Six. We're on six. Technician A says replacement of the fuse is the only repair necessary for a blown fuse. Is that right? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. There's a guy that's been there. Technician B says a blown fuse caused by a system fault such as high resistance. Yeah. High resistance? Is that going to blow a fuse? No, no. What's the difference between a short and an open? Short and an open? Oh, no, a short means it's touching something. A short means it's rubbing against the frame. Right. And that means it's getting back to an the battery. An open means it's just... An open it means it's a connector to unplug or it's cut. Got it? High resistance means it's touching, but there's corrosion there. Got it? You guys like that? Is that pretty smooth? Yeah. All right. So this one, neither one of them. Yeah, so... Uh, now, uh, yeah, neither one of those guys is right. That's number six. Okay, let's move on down. Technician A says the first step in diagnosing a problem is to verify what the complaint is. What did I say, Lori? Verify the concern. Technician B says that a technical service bulletin can tell you the cure for some problems. Who's right about that? Yeah. D? Yeah, you're, yeah, you're member seven. Uh, seven's going to be C. Oh, no, uh, C, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but basically, uh, what I tell you about the TSBs, the technical service bulletins are really good tools because sometimes if you don't want to go out there and have to beat your head against the wall and work and work and work and work and try to figure out what's wrong with them, it's really the smart guy goes to the, well, here's one that this guy emailed me, right? This guy, this guy emails me and he says, um, this, um, let's see, how would you put that? He said, my gauges all don't work on my F-150 5.4. Super Duty 99 model. All right. Now, I didn't go to TSBs, but I went to Identifix. I go to Identifix. I pull it up. And what they're saying is that the, you know, the, the wires that are coming up through the stalk for your overdrive switch, they have a tendency, because you're moving it back and forth a lot, they'll rub and they'll get in against the ground. And they'll pop a particular fuse. And I saw case study after case study after case study after case study where that was usually what was wrong with those trucks. Fairly easy, right? All right, so yep, you'll find you'll find a lot of that kind of stuff going on where you already know where the weak links in a chain are. That's where you make your money. Have you done it before? You know, you also become the hero and you make some money off the job and you send them on their way. You know, you make a profit. That's what you're there for. You do pretty good last week. Turn some hours. Uh, it was all right. We was kind of slow though. All right. Did you have a good? You had fun though, right? Yeah. Yeah. You learned something. Yeah. All right. Well, you're always supposed to. You always learn something every day. All right. Number what number we on? We're on eight. 
Technician A says a misadjusted blend door can cause poor AC operation. I was just talking about that. Technician B says you can check this by clamping off a heater hose. Which one of those guys is correct? Mm -hmm. Both the guys are correct, but once again, make that gum sure you're clamping off the right heater hose. You want to clamp the one off that's feeding the heater core. Don't guess at it and just clamp one of them off, or you may wind up putting the heater core in Sally Mae's car. She says, after you worked on my car, now I smell antifreeze, and there's all kind of steam and green stuff dripping out on the carpet under that, you know? Go ahead. Yeah. Okay, now then, number nine, technician A says, Foul-smelling air from the AC ducts is caused by bacteria growing on the evaporator fins. That's true, true. All right. Technician B says this problem can be cured by installing a control that operates the blower motor after the vehicle is shut off. I never heard that. That's a GM thing. That is a Cadillac, or you can actually get a kit. And what you do is you put it on there, and when everything is just right, you know, the temperature, humidity, and all that kind of stuff just right, uh, when you switch off the car, you may walk by a Cadillac or one of them GM cars that's set up with this in a parking lot and hear the blower motor running. This is cool, too. How many of you know that when you get in your car in the summertime in the subtropics down here in South Alabama, uh, if you actually had a stake laying in there, it would be going... Oh, yeah, you could. Yeah. How hot it gets in the summer. Oh, yeah. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it gets blistering hot in your car in the summertime. Oh, well, yeah. some of these vehicles... The ones that I've, you know, some of these Mercedes vehicles, they've got solar panels that will run a bore all the time. It's just driven by the solar panels. And uh, the, the the newest model uh, Prius, Toyota Prius, you can get one with an option. The whole roof is a solar panel. And it's not there to charge the battery. It's there to run this bore. So when it's blistering hot in the summertime, the hotter it gets, the more that bore runs. And you walk up with one of those little cars and you get in it and it's just nice and cool. <laughs> Nothing hot in there. You can get one from uh, Walgreens or somewhere for about $35 that you just hang on the glass and the solar panel is exposed and, you know, it actually, you got a little vent and it's supposed to be pulling air through the car. Well, I bought one of those. And yeah, it spins and runs and all that, but it don't move enough air to make no difference. <laughs> if they had a better fan in it, it would probably work, you know. But, I mean, uh, the little solar panel, you know, in theory, it seems like it would be a great idea. Now, if you got a lot of air pulling through there, doesn't use the car battery, totally uses solar. And the hotter the sun is, the more the thing blows. You get in there, and it's just nice and breezy and cool. Well, imagine that. Imagine getting in your car, and it's not hot in the summer. Wouldn't that feel good? Yeah. Yeah. I usually roll my windows down a little bit. You know what happens if you roll your windows down? That's like an Indian rain dance. Here comes the rain. (laughs) That's how that happens. All right. Technician A says the refrigerant line ground out problem makes a whining noise at moderate speeds. Technician B says the knocking noises are a sure sign the compressor has... Okay. Foul smelling air from the AC ducts is caused by bacteria. You know what you can do? They make some stuff, by the way, that you can mist into that evaporator case and kill that bacteria permanently so it will never grow on there again. The only problem is you got to use real good breathing equipment while you're doing it, or you shall surely die. <laughs> and I'm not kidding. It will kill you. So it kills the bacteria really good, but it will kill you too. <laughs> this one guy, this one guy that they were going to have doing those at the Ford place, he had facial hair. And they said, in order to wear this thing where it'll still get around your face, you're going to have to shave that beard off. Mm-hmm. And he said, well, I'm not shaving my beard off. And they said, get out. He said, what? He said, yeah, we need you to do these, and we need you to shave your beard off so that you won't breathe this stuff and die. Did he shave his beard? Yeah. (laughs) Because he wanted to keep his job. Now, his beard was not really a nice, full, beautiful beard. You know, it was a scraggly-looking thing about like Archie's got. (laughs) Basically, all he had to do was just shave it off, you know. And uh, you need to go see Wanda Strickland and apologize to her for not going to her class. You going to do that? Make sure you do that. Tell her I sent you, okay? All right, anyway. <clears throat> All right. Uh, now, incidentally, nine, by the way, is C. Technician uh, A says the refrigerant line ground out problem makes a whining noise, moderate speed. We already did that. Right, neither technician. If a blower does not operate at any speed, what do you check first? Fuse. Fuse, basically. Why, you know why you don't check the resistor? Because the resistor won't keep it from blowing in high. All right. Which of the following is a frequent cause of air conditioning system noise and vibration? Anybody got any idea? 
Defective reed valves, misadjusted pressure cycling switch, improper Push clutch start. air gap, or incorrectly routed lines and hoses. See. Incorrectly routed lines and hoses. What do I mean by that? If those lines are laying against the shock tower really hard and heavy, or something like that, or touching something, and they're not, you know, they're not routed properly, they can actually call, you can actually hear that refrigerant bouncing through them, and they actually, you know, will make racket. Uh, this technician in this picture is checking AC operation. With the compressor running, the suction line should be what? Cold. Warm, cold, frozen, or hot. Cold. And there's the picture that we're talking about right there. Cold. All right. Okay, there we go. Suction line is always supposed to be cold. All right. Now then, what's the expected temperature when touched at the point shown? Not enough information. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> That's plenty of information. What is that device? What's that thing that you're looking at? Huh? It's going to have to be hot, yeah, basically. I'm going to say 14 is going to be an A. It's supposed to be hot. A missing AC service cap can allow a leak of up to how much refrigerant per year? One pound a year. Most of these newer cars don't hold but about a pound anyway. Access to hidden areas behind the dash can often be improved by removing the what? You want to pull the windshield out? Yeah, you can actually pull the glove box and get back there. You can tell that man's pulled a wrench before, can't you? All right. <clears throat> Vibrating AC hoses that make ground out noise can be repaired by doing what? Separating them from the yeah, Actually, uh, let's see. Actually, that's going to be uh, C? either A or B. You know, clamping them. Clamping them together or separating them from the surface. A high pitched noise from the compressor during engagement can be caused by what? Uh, yeah, well, excessive high side pressure can cause that. Engine off HVAC inspection checks include these points, except 19. C, you're not going to be able to read it. I mean, uh, AC pressure is worth a flip. You know what the deal is on AC pressures? What happens when you hook your gauges up? What do you see? Static pressures will be what? About the same, right? Yeah. Because they're gonna, it's gonna neutralize. Take a while for it to get there. Have you ever switched off an air compressor or heard somebody switch off a car and you walk by and you hear something going? Yep. That's the air conditioner equalizing. The high side's going toward the low and the low side's going high. They're doing it like this. Well, the compressor is what pulls them out of balance. So anyway, they, they're gonna try to go back to the level if they can. <coughs> but anyway, you're not gonna be able to check AC pressure. Oh, I, I was going somewhere with that. There is not any good numbers for static pressures. Now, if you hook it up and there's nothing but static pressure there, you may have anywhere from 60 to 110 pounds of static pressure, but you still don't know anything until you fire the uh, air conditioner up and see where the pressure go. Technician A says a stinky evaporator can be cured by spraying a fungicide into the fresh air register in front of the windshield. Technician B says this problem is more common in areas of high humidity. Who's yeah, correct about that? Both of them are right. Both of them guys are right. Okay. 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 Okay.